How many of you folks can identify with that last song that Sister Baker was singing? Amen. We have all been blessed. God's been so good to me. Oh, yes. And I know he's been good to you as well. Yeah. I'm so thankful that I could be part of this meeting. And I appreciate all the members of Liberty Baptist Church being here this evening, as well as the folks from the Homeland Baptist Church. Appreciate you all coming. And then the visitors, you are honored guests here in the house of God. We appreciate you so much and asking God to speak to you this evening. And we don't want to forget those that are watching and listening by way of the internet. We thank God for you taking the time to view the broadcast and to listen to the word of God. So we'd like to say hello to all of you and may the Lord bless you. I'm interested this evening in the gospel of Mark chapter number five. You have a copy of the inspired words of God. I would encourage you to turn with us. Mark's gospel, chapter number five. There are three miracles performed by the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 5. Certainly won't take the time to delve into detail in all these miracles. But I would like to mention that in verses 1 through 20, the Lord demonstrated his power over demons. You remember the maniac of Gadara, how that he was crazy and possessed with these unclean spirits, and how that the Lord Jesus cast them out and gave this man a brand new life, demonstrating that the Lord has power over demons. The second miracle that we find here in this chapter illustrates the Lord's power over disease. We'll look at that miracle in detail in just a moment. But the chapter closes with the Lord's power over death. How he raised the daughter of Jairus from the dead. And the point is that Jesus Christ has all power in heaven and in earth. There is nothing in your life and there is nothing in my life that is too big for God to handle. He has all power and I'm so glad that he does. Would you stand with me tonight all over the house if you're able as we read from the Holy Scriptures? In Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And uh, when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Notice this now. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, And it spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, 
came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. I like that kind of faith. She said, If I could just touch his clothes, I know I'll be made whole. And verse 29 said, Straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, sayest thou, who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Now watch verse 34. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the reading of the scripture. I pray that you'll add your blessings to the preaching and the expounding of thy word tonight. We realize, Lord, that all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. So I pray right now that the Holy Ghost will move. I pray that you'll get Brother Jeremiah out of the way. And I ask, Lord, that you'll have your will and your way in this service tonight for the glory of God. I'm asking you, Father, to speak to the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl in this audience, as well as those that are listening by way of the Internet throughout the world. I pray for a great move of God in this hour. And we'll thank you for all that's accomplished for you alone are worthy, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. I want you to picture the scene with me here for just a moment. As this man by the name of Jairus has a daughter who is lying at the point of death. He's come to the Lord Jesus and made requests for his daughter. Jesus has graciously agreed to go to his home and to minister to her. And the crowd that heard this need and this promise are following them. So here you have this man by the name of Jairus and the Lord Jesus and this great crowd proceeding to his home. But in the midst of this movement of God, there appears another individual who has a tremendous need. And there is a connection between these two needs here that Christ meets. The connection is the number 12. Notice with me that the daughter of Jairus was 12 years old at the time of her sickness. That's according to Luke chapter 8 and verse 42. So she's 12 years old. But Jesus is met with a woman who is suffering. She's dealing with a sickness, an issue of blood, and she's had this disease for 12 long years. So think about this now. While Jairus has enjoyed 12 years of delight with his daughter, this woman has endured 12 years of despair with her disease. But I want you to know tonight that though their needs on the outside appear different, the fact of the matter is they both needed the same thing. Or may I say, they both needed the same person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And his touch brings hope. His touch brings healing. And his touch brings help in the lives of sinners. 
And so I want us to consider this woman tonight for just a few moments, and we'll be done. Think with me, first of all, about her condition before his touch. And as I talk about her condition, I want you to let the Lord walk you down memory lane. And I want you to think about who you were and where you were before the Lord found you. Notice, first of all, that she was sick. The Bible said she had an issue of blood. This issue of blood denotes a hemorrhage. It is a serious problem, and it relates to the flowing of her blood. No doubt in my mind, Brother Duncan, that this issue has made her life miserable on a daily basis. Uh, and with this losing of the blood, uh, she's no doubt become uh, anemic, uh, and she's pale, uh, and she's sickly, uh, and she's weak. Uh, she's walking around looking uh, like the walking dead. Uh, and oh, I wanna say this evening, uh, this is not popular. Uh, but it's the truth. The Bible says that the sinner is dead in their trespasses and in their sins. And without Jesus Christ, you are weak. If you are without Jesus Christ, you are spiritually depraved. You are anemic, if you will. And you're like the walking dead this very evening if you've never met the Lord Jesus Christ. She was sick and she was suffering. The Bible said she had suffered many things. She suffered physically, but not only that, she suffered mentally. How many of you would be honest tonight and admit when you feel bad physically, it affects you mentally? When you are sick in body, it begins to weigh on your mind and it begins to weary your spirit. And you think about this woman's pain. It's bad enough to have pain, even for a moment. But after 12 long years of suffering, can you imagine how depressed and how discouraged this woman must have been? She's suffering physically and mentally. And my friend, not only that, she's suffering socially. You don't have to turn there. But I'd like you to consider that we're in Mark chapter 5. Christ has not gone to Calvary yet. The Old Testament law is still implemented. And according to the book of Leviticus chapter 15, this woman's physical condition has placed restraints and restrictions upon her social life. She is considered unclean. And because she's considered unclean, she is outcast. She is separated. She would not have been permitted to participate in the temple ceremonies, if you will. She has been disgraced. She's been looked down upon, both spiritually and socially. And so her condition has produced separation. May I say to you tonight, my friend, I'm not here to hurt you. I want to help you. But the truth of the matter is, sin always separates man from God. That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. Sin separated 
man from God. The Bible said it's by one man sin entered into the world and so death passed upon all men because all have sinned. Somebody needs to say amen. The Bible says that all have sinned and we've all come short of the glory of God. If you're sitting here tonight thinking you're perfect, I hope the Holy Ghost will speak to your soul and let you know that you are a sinner and your sins have caused you to be separated from God. The Lord said, My hand's not short that it cannot save. Neither is my ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you. Your sins have hid God's face from you that he will not hear. Separation. Social suffering, uh, mental suffering, uh, physical suffering. Uh, but let me add one more on top of that. She suffered financially. The Bible says she spent all A-L-L that she had. And after spending all she had, uh, she didn't get any better. She just got worse. Sounds like to me she didn't have a very good experience with the doctors of her day. Sounds like they might have been quacks, if you will. I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with going to the doctor. And even Jesus said, they that are sick need a physician. But my friend, this woman didn't have a very good experience with the doctors. She spent all that she had. And so not only is she sick, hurting, depressed, and outcast, but now she's broke. She's so broke she can't even pay attention. Her finances have been depleted. It's bad enough to have health problems, but you add financial problems on top of that. That's like pouring salt on an open wound. What a sad situation to go to the doctor, try to figure out what's wrong. And most of the time, let's just be honest they'll take an educated guess at what's wrong with you. Scribble something down on a piece of paper that you can't even read. Send you to go get a medicine you can't pronounce. And if that doesn't work, then you come back in a month and uh, we'll try something else and take a little bit more of your money. Hello? <laughs> she is sick. She's suffering and she's saddened. The Bible said she was nothing better but rather grew worse. Every attempt of human physicians failed ha, to help this suffering woman. Ha, how discouraging that must have been. Brother, she must have felt like uh, she was destined to die ha, in the shape she was in. Ha, I mean, it had to be depressing uh, to know that she couldn't find uh, any help anywhere. Uh, and I want to tell you what we've got uh, in 2011. Uh, Pastor, we have sinners uh, that are running everywhere uh, to find some help help and find some hope. They're riding to doctor rehabilitation. They're riding to doctor reformation. They're riding to doctor religion. But none of these doctors can do anything to change the heart of the sinner. All they know how to do is treat the symptoms. That's what religion does. 
Well, you've got to change your clothes and you've got to cut your hair and you've got to cover up this and cover up that and you've got to do this different and you've got to do that different. But I'm telling you, friend, uh, if the heart is never changed uh, by the power of God, uh, that sinner uh, will not find help uh, and they will not have hope uh, unless God uh, does a work uh, in their heart. There's only one physician that can heal bleeding, broken, bankrupt sinners. His name is the Lord Jesus. So have you thought about her condition now? And have you thought about yours? Why don't you walk down memory lane and think about who you were before God saved you? What you were before God saved you? I like that song that said, show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. I tell you, it doesn't hurt us every once in a while to take a look back at our past and to be reminded of the mess we were in before God saved us. When you look at all that God's done for you, where he's brought you from and where you could have been, it'll make you appreciate and it'll make you thankful for the amazing grace of God that saved a wretch like me. So that's our condition before his touch. I want you to think secondly about her coming for his touch. The Bible says she heard of Jesus and she came in the press behind and touched his garment. And sometimes we skip over things in the Bible. But she didn't come to Jesus until she first heard of Jesus. The church needs to realize tonight how important it is to hear. Ever thought about something? God gave you two ears and one mouth. I wonder if he wants you to listen twice as much as you talk. How many of us know that we've often failed in that category? It's important to hear. She would have never, listen, she would have never come to Jesus had she not heard of Jesus. And as Bible believers tonight, we recognize that the Spirit of God is the one who leads a sinner to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God brings to us the Word of God and the Spirit and the Word, they draw us to Christ. You didn't come to him on your own. You wasn't seeking the Lord. Uh, my friend, he sent the Spirit uh, and he sent the Word. Uh, and hearing about Christ uh, was the key uh, to being healed uh, by Christ. Uh, she heard uh, that Jesus was passing by. Hey, let me tell you something. Uh, you know what Church Hill, uh, Tennessee uh, needs to hear? That Jesus uh, is still passing by. Uh, you know what this church needs to be telling everybody that we can Jesus is still passing by why they will never come unless they hear that's right hearing is the key in the book of Romans chapter number 10 the apostle Paul said this how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
Now, I understand that God calls pastors and evangelists and missionaries to an anointed special calling and position. I clearly understand that. But in the actual sense of the word here, every person who is saved has an obligation to preach the gospel message to every sinner you come in contact with. Hearing about Jesus Christ is what people need. How many of you would agree with me tonight that America has major problems? Would you raise your hand? May I say to you that America's problems will not be solved by social programs? May I say to you that America's problems will not be solved by better politicians if there is such a thing? We often think they are, and then once they're in office a while, we realize that they weren't what we thought they were. The answer to America's problems is sinners hearing about Jesus. They must hear about Jesus. Now the news media is not going to tell them that. Every day they're going to broadcast news. But how many knows that most of the time it's going to be something tragic. Somebody got shot. Somebody got killed. Something terrible happened. Oh, listen, friend. The church has a greater message. The church has a positive message. And the message is... Jesus saves. Jesus saves. He is the one who can solve the greatest problem that mankind has. And that's S I N sin. Only Jesus can solve the sin problem. They need to hear that, which means you and I need to tell that. I'd like to say to every preacher that's here or listening, preach Jesus. People are not interested in your preferences. That doesn't save anybody. People are not interested in your traditions. And this is the way we do things around here. That doesn't save anybody. People need to hear. Jesus Christ went to Calvary. He suffered. He bled. He died. He paid the ultimate price to redeem his people from their sins. That's what we need to be preaching. She had to hear. But she also had hindrances. I want you to think about something tonight. Do you realize all this woman had to overcome to get to Jesus? I told you she was weak. Physically worn out. But she didn't let that stop her. Let me tell you something. You're not always going to feel like being in church. But the very time you don't feel like it and you let the devil convince you to stay home will be the service that you needed most. Just get up and come on to the house of God anyway. And like that lady said where we were today, Pastor, I didn't feel like it when I went, but I left feeling better. Amen. Thank God. Though we're weak, it is urgent that we get to where Jesus is. The disability from her condition hindered her. The denseness of the crowd hindered her. Listen, there was people all around Jesus. She had to press through this tight crowd in order to touch Christ. But the seriousness of her problem motivated her to be strong in her persistence. Not only that, friend, but you think about the discovery by her critics. There are those in this crowd who know the law 
law of Leviticus and they know who she is and if they see her they're going to be angry and they're going to want to eject her from the crowd but as politely as she could she just pressed through that crowd excuse me please excuse me I need to get to Jesus let me buy I need to get to Jesus what are you saying preacher I'm saying she didn't let anybody stand in her way of getting what she needed and my goodness tonight how many times have we quenched the Holy Spirit of God how many times have we left the service without getting our needs met because we were ashamed or we were embarrassed about what somebody would think about us How many times have sinners sat back there under Holy Ghost conviction? Worried over what so-and-so might think. And walked out the back door lost. My friend, I'm not being rude. But you listen carefully. They die in their sins. Five seconds after death, it won't matter a flip what so-and-so thought. They'll wish they had got to Jesus. And oh, I'm telling you tonight, don't you ever be ashamed to do what God tells you to do. Don't ever be ashamed to testify. Don't ever be ashamed to get up and sing. Don't ever be ashamed to come to an altar. Don't worry about what people think. What people think doesn't matter anyway. It's what God knows about us that really counts this very evening. You've got to overcome obstacles and be persistent. But I want you to think about her hope. She said in verse 28, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. I like that kind of confidence. I like the fact that this woman didn't look at Jesus the way the skeptics did. She didn't look at Jesus like an ordinary man. She didn't think of Jesus as just a great teacher. She looked at him as the son of God. Amen. She looked at him as the great physician. She believed, Brother Darren, that he could do for her in one moment what all the doctors of the world couldn't do in 12 long years and I'm glad tonight that we have a God that can do for us in one moment what the whole world couldn't do for us in an entire lifetime. So away with I hope so, away with I think so. We need some people in our churches, pastor, who will say, I know what God can do for me. Not confidence in myself, but confidence in the power of my Savior. That's the hope she had. That's her condition before his touch. And her coming for his touch. I want you to notice with me thirdly, her cure from his touch. My friend, she reached out and touched the hem of the Lord's garment. And Mark says straightway, Luke says immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up. In a moment she was healed then and there. And I want to tell you that the Lord Jesus always brings immediate remedy to the sinner. How many of you could testify tonight that salvation is not an installment program? <laughs> It's not you get part of God now and you go out and reform your life and get a little bit better and six months down the road you get a little more salvation and then maybe if you live good enough by the end of your life you'll get the completed package. Oh no, it doesn't work that way. The Holy Ghost draws, gives you the ability to repent and believe and when you call upon the name of the Lord. I'll tell you when you're saved, you are saved immediately. Right then and there. It was a fast cure. 
I want you to notice some facts about the cure. The Bible said the fountain of her blood was dried up. Like I said, medical science treats the symptoms. The power of God treats the source. Medicine treats in order that we might have temporary relief. Jesus brings eternal healing. The Bible said the problem was stopped. She didn't just start to bleed a little bit less. No. All the bleeding was stopped. She was completely healed. Brother, it wasn't just an improvement of her old life. It was a brand new life. Somebody say amen. I'm glad that salvation uh, by the grace of God uh, is not just a notch up uh, or a step up uh, of your old life. Uh, I'm glad uh, that it's a brand new life. Uh, And if any man uh, be in Christ, uh, he's a new creature. Uh, All things pass away. uh, And behold, uh, all things uh, become new. The source of the problem. Notice the saving from the problem. Mark used the word whole. I looked at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all their comments on this story. The word whole is used by all three writers. I added them up. You know how many times the word whole is used? Seven. You who study the Bible, you know what seven is. It's complete. It's done. It's perfect. Hey, and that's what salvation is. It's complete deliverance from the condemnation and the captivity of sin. Listen very carefully. You are completely set free tonight. If you're a saved child of God, sin can no longer have dominion over you. Oh, sure, the flesh still sins, but your soul has been saved and set free and there's nothing that the devil can do to bring your soul back under the wrath of God if the son has made you free you are free indeed thank God she was made whole then came the feeling the Bible said in verse 29 she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Remember I told you this, it affected her mentally. Thank God she got evidence that the problem was gone. She felt that she had been healed. It wouldn't have been complete had she not been able to feel what she had. And listen, don't misunderstand me or misquote me tonight. I know that we're not saved by our feelings, but I do want to say thank God we do have something that we can feel. Amen. We have a salvation that we know is real, and we have a Holy Spirit that can pass by and bless our hearts and let us feel the power of God and the knowledge Knowledge that salvation is real. But I want to make it very clear that feelings didn't come until after the faith. Some people are sitting around waiting on a feeling. You don't wait on a feeling. You trust Jesus Christ by faith and the feelings will come after. Amen. Amen. The liberal world today wants to change the feelings of the sinner. Oh, come to our church Sunday morning. You're guaranteed to have a good time. And I'm going to be honest. They probably do. But my question is this. If you walk into a church and I entertain you for an hour, and make you feel good. But I do not tell you about Jesus. What good did I do you? So we must emphasize faith in Christ. 
The last thing I'd like you to notice is her change after his touch. Her change after his touch. There was a confession. Luke said in chapter 8 verse 47, she declared before all the people for what call she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. She made a confession about what had been done in her life. Friend, are you really saved? Then you ought not be ashamed to tell somebody what God's done for you. That's exactly right. The Bible said I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The Bible said, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Uh, if you're really saved tonight, uh, you ought not be ashamed uh, to tell somebody uh, what Jesus has done for you. Amen. Then let me go one step further. As a Christian, when God does something for you, I think you ought to go to church and tell it. Amen. And here's why. Somebody may be sitting in that house that's been dealing with the exact same problem you're dealing with. And when they hear you tell about how God delivered you and how God helped you, it might encourage them uh, that God can help them too. Uh, I say to you, friend, uh, we ought never be ashamed uh, to testify about what the Lord's done. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Jesus said, uh, if you're ashamed of me uh, before men, uh, I'd be ashamed of you in the presence of my Father. May God help us not ever be ashamed to confess. Yes. There was the confession, then there was the change. Jesus said, thy faith hath made thee whole. Notice the principle. It's not the physical touch of the garment that saved her. It's faith. Faith is the key to pleasing God. As a matter of fact, the Bible said without faith, it is impossible to please God. You don't believe? Then, my friend, you'll die in your sins. Amen. Jesus says, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Those who say, I will not believe on Christ, I will not come to him, I will not accept the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, I will not accept his sacrifice for my sins, have no part in the family of God. God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There must be faith. That's the principle. Then there's the peace. Jesus said, go in peace. Boy, I like that. I'm fixing to close, but let me say a word about this peace. Ain't nothing in all the world like knowing you've got peace with God. Amen. How many knows that's the truth tonight? Amen. There ain't nothing in all the world like being at peace with God. But you'll never know that peace till you meet the Prince of Peace. The world is looking for peace tonight, but they're looking in all the wrong places, Brother Larry. Some are looking in a drink. Some are looking in a bottle of pills. Some are looking at a needle in their veins. Some are looking at, at, at a lottery ticket. But all they're trying to do is find something to make them happy. But the sad reality is that when they lay their head down at night, they will not have a peace in their heart uh, until they know the Prince uh, of Peace, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Christ uh, is the only way uh, to have peace with God and to have heaven when this life ends. I like this. Jesus sealed her faith. He stilled her fears and secured her future. Now here's my message. over 2,000 years have come and gone. Listen very carefully to my closing statement, please. 2,000 years or more have come and gone since this woman touched Christ and was healed. But how wonderful it is to know tonight that you and I can still Amen. touch him. Are you hurting tonight? You can still touch him. Are you sick tonight? You can still touch him. Are you lost tonight? 
you can still touch him. We have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And he says, come to me and you'll find grace and mercy that will help you in a time of need. I'm glad we have an available God who says, come to me. I'll make you whole. I'm glad we can still 